hey, it's me, the pile of dishes in your sink that you're letting soak. I know that you have to do a lot more dishes now that you're not eating out as much. And I know that it's not necessarily the most fun chore to do, but you know, it can make it more fun while you're watching me. You could turn on an episode of this podcast before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series. Just a few quick announcements. First, I am very excited to announce that we finally have a piece of merchandise with Canti Potter on it. It is a 15 ounce camper mug. So yes, that means we have Canti Pottery. It is a nice white with black speckles camper mug. It's nice and wide so that you can use it as a coffee mug or a tea mug or a cereal bowl or a yogurt bowl or an oatmeal bowl. I have a camper mug and I use it for all of these things. I'm not joking. And now we have one available over at potterlesspodcast.com slash merch with a big old Canti Potter design that Kelly put together that's on the front and on the back. It says Potterless. It is beautiful. It is gorgeous. And you can pre-order it now over at potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. Speaking of things that have me very excited, we've new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Violet Sullivan, Elena Neal, Sam C, Gustavo Delgadillo, Oram, Juliet Stevenson, Liz Rowley, Alyssa Royce, and Leslie Blowin. A name correction for Nieselkins, Rana Othman, Casey Tunnell, and Julia Pokey. Shout out to Kay Thaker who upgraded their pledge. And of course, shout out to our producer level patrons. Vicky, Aaron, Clown, Marchismo, Samantha, Juan, Rosemary, Maria, Romina, Audra, Eleanor, Nikita, Ali, Amelia, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Haley, Alex, John, Noel, Liz, Brandon, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jen, Jennifer, Friday, Summer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Mark, Polly, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addy, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Alicia, Kafir, Sarah, Marta, Eileen, Keegan, Mr. Folk, Maya, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Skyla, Edel, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Elizabeth, Michael, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Aurora, Marcos, Courtney, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Jenny, McKenna, Heather, Brad, Thomas, Brianna, Kevin, Laurie, Chrissy, Yarl, Ashley, Pita, Sophie, Jen, and Callahan, Leah, Melissa, Bella, Melanie, Elizabeth, Britt, Becca, Reese, Adam, Joseph, Lily's mom, Tyrone, Money, Madison, Kyle, Tonks, GK, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, David, Matt, Okama, Hime, Yimki, Boney, Pony, Jacob, Kelsey, Taco, Bluefish, Rike, Taylor, Rochelle. Megan, Alicia, Riley, Colleen, Laurel, Rossanne, Erica, Miranda, Landon, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Richard, Sandra, Craig, Andren, Kay, Steve, Lior, Angela, Julia, Demi, Kelsey, Michael, Danae, Michelle, Callista, Kringle, Love, Kesh, Jennifer, Crystal, Henrika, Jeremy, Delkis, Katrina, Jerrica, Michelle, Casey, Megan, A Thousand Zot, Serenity, Jack, Sophia, Matthew, Dane, Rochelle, Kirsty, Robin, Chick, Mermaid, Aaron, Biatch, Ilaria, Liam, Lori, Gregory, Kristen, Nina, Ribbon, Kaka, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never plug a phone charger into their phone but fail to realize that the plug portion is not plugged into the wall, so it's not doing anything. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons, and get access to bonus content such as director's commentary, my notes, exclusive live streams, exclusive merchandise, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 135 of Potterless, the first of many covering a very Potter senior year guest starring Melissa Anelli. And welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 28-year-old man who never read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He read them as an adult. He watched and read some other stuff. And now he's watching fan-made content. He's on to a very Potter senior year. That's what we're discussing today with our guest, someone who was on the show way back when and has been on interspersingly at live LeakyCon things with me. But now back in a regular Potterless episode, it's Melissa Anelli from LeakyCon and Pottercast and Roll Nine Three Quarters. <laughs> so many fun things. Mischief Management. Melissa, how's it going? <laughs> Hello, it's good. I don't know what day it is. Time is a flat circle. Mm -mm. Everything is pretend. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. Dates aren't real. Time isn't real. All we have is each other. For instance, you just said LeakyCon, and did you know we would be closing in on LeakyCon right now as we record this? Uh, unfortunately, yes, because I still haven't deleted it from my calendar because it felt too oh, sad. <laughs> sad. Very sad. And actually, um, as I was watching, you know, Harry Potter sequel, it just is a different world. This idea of all of us gathering in one place is a wholly different world. It's even weird just when I watch TV shows or documentaries or movies when there's more than four people in a room together. Just watching that, I think, oh, this is strange. So yeah, to watch LeakyCon stuff where it's just thousands of people in the same room is very confusing. Yeah, hopefully we get back there soon. I know that the first, I'm ready for the first LeakyCon again, whenever, when, whenever that is, it is scheduled for uh, next June, but we're going to do some just fun stuff to celebrate the idea that we're all back together and I can't wait. I'm very excited for it as well. So let's dive into our topic today, which is a very Potter senior year, which the reason you're on for this is because it took place at a LeakyCon and you run that. So I <laughs> wanted to get you on because I figured you had oodles and doodles of behind the scenes information and fun stories and great little tales you could tell me about it. So as far as just putting it on the prep work that went into it, like how did this come to be? I had no 
no idea that it was at a leaky con until I actually looked at the YouTube videos for it when I was starting to make these episodes. Yeah, it's wild. It came to be, I mean, like we had Star Kid at LeakyCon 2011 and can, you know, we just felt like kindred spirits. We we've known that we had known them since they burst onto the scene in 09. LeakyCon 11 was the first opportunity we had to know them. And um when this idea came up, originally Nick Lang and Pat their manager told me, "Oh, we're interested in doing just like, you know, we're going to sit in chairs and read from a script. And even that, I was like, yes, fully, let's do it. <laughs> we had done a musical at LeakyCon in 2011. It was called The Fountain of Fair Fortune. And Lena Gabrielle, who is a fantastic composer, made this beautiful musical that's like actually based on the canon is the same events. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we had a little bit of experience of doing a musical, but like in a very uh, rough and tough way. Mm -hmm. So we were like, yeah, that sounds phenomenal. We have a stage. Let's do it. And then because they're crazy the way that we're crazy in the terms of like, well, we have all these people together. Let's, I just I think we all just knew that it was just going to get keep progressing. So the next time I heard from them, it's going to be like, hey, we're just going to read some scripts, but um, there's going to be costumes. And I was like, that's fine, that's cool. And then the next time it was like, um, you know, we might have like a like a like a little like a, like a prop or two. And then Corey Lubowicz, who is their scenic designer and also designed the beautiful set that you see on that stage. I think he was the first one to say to me, I think this might be getting big <laughs> and sort of made the set with AVPSY. It's not totally why the set is designed that way, but it was made to be sort of permissible to a musical. <laughs> and before we knew it, more and more people were coming. Like we didn't know if Darren was coming. Darren was in the middle of his meteoric first rise. This is like, it's in the middle of Glee, pre-American Horror Story, but like still he got cast on Glee the week after we got him confirmed for coming to LeakyCon 2011. Uh. And then he got cast on Glee. And that was a whole thing in and of itself. And then so a year later, he was a star. And like, he was an instant star. And so we didn't know if Darren was coming. It kept going back and forth. But before we knew it, more and more of the star kids were confirmed. And I think there were like 30 of them in the end. And then as we got closer, every time I talked to Nick, he was just like, yeah, you know, we've got some songs and maybe we'll just sing them, but like no orchestra or no, like no band or anything like that. And then the next time it was like, um, is it okay if we like bring in a band? It was like, <laughs> listen, we have the stage. Let's figure this out. But I can't even express to you what it was like producing this musical in the middle <laughs> of a Harry Potter convention, because that stage that you see is our main stage. It's where everything big was happening that weekend. So it's funny you mentioned the Darren Chris thing because I am not 100% familiar with his whole timeline. I never watched Glee, but I knew that his fame at least intersected with this a little bit. It's funny because when he comes on stage, just by his haircut alone, I was like, oh, he was already very famous in Glee at this point, wasn't he? <laughs> like, <laughs> the, <laughs> the hair alone gave away. Yes. Oh, someone told him to cut his awful hair. I got it. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> And then he also, he just seemed, and some people warned me before I watched it, a lot of people told me, hey, there was an issue with his microphone, so yeah. don't hold that against them. And then also, Darren was very much a last minute addition to it. And you can tell that he has, a lot of a lot of the people are holding their books, but pretty much know all of their lines. Darren, Chris is actively reading the script the entire time, so I'm sure he was very busy and did not have enough time to rehearse. Well to give you some context for that, first of all, what champs all of these people Amazing. are. They worked themselves to the bone that whole weekend. We set up, um, we had like a like a practice area for them and we gave them as much time on that stage as they possibly could. Some of it meant being overnight in that uh, main stage because that was when the stage was available. They understood that we had a convention to put on as well. Darren flew in at four o'clock that morning. That oh is gosh. the first time he got to rehearse any bit of that. And now we had bought him like several different flights because this is what, what we wanted to be sure. But in the end, because he's Darren and he didn't, he didn't know what his schedule was going to be like, he went ahead and bought his flights. And so we knew he was like coming, but I, because his career was in that stage, there was always the chance that maybe he wouldn't. I don't think they had a backup. I think somebody else would have popped in there if they could. But like he flew in. He got there at four in the morning. We had rented a suite for them and the hotel upped it. So we had like this like kind of small, maybe like two, three bedroom 
suite at the hotel using our upgrades and the points that you get for doing nice, for nice. renting that many rooms. But we said, like, here, have it all weekend rehearse, you know? And then the hotel, I think LeakyCon was the whole hotel that weekend. Oh my god. The gosh. hotel was very grateful and they upped it to the craziest suite I've ever seen in my life. So I went into it at like four o'clock that morning and it's just like this like long marble hallway. There's rooms shooting off from it everywhere and there's just Dead looking Stark is just flopped on the floor, literally everywhere. And I like tripped over Darren. I'm like, oh, you're here. Hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> and he got that script in his hand and just worked himself silly until it went up. Now, this was Saturday afternoon at a convention, right. which is, again, like the biggest real estate on the biggest stage of the convention. And they had it for literally the whole day to prep. We had like one thing in the morning. And other oh, than wow. that, we just gave them the stage. That's huge. There was just no other way to do this. You had five camera positions. They built little areas to like put the, the camera positions on. The room fit like 3,200 people, plus we had an overflow room. So they had... 3,000 3D glasses, because the joke was that this was a very Potter uh, musical 3D. Oh, my gosh. And so everybody had 3D glasses under their seats. And so we had volunteers going out and putting these under the seats. The hotel, not knowing that this is what was supposed to happen, <sighs> took them off. Of course. We had to go oh. and put them back. It was, to give you an idea, a Broadway theater is between 500 and usually around 1,500 seats. I think the biggest Broadway theater, and it, there's only one of them, fits like 1,900. This was a 3,200-seat room. Yeah, I've been in those LeakyCon rooms. They're quite large. Yeah, very big. It was at the Chicago Hilton. It's a beautiful, old, big space. So at least it wasn't like a cavernous, like 40-foot ceiling, you know, but it was still really large. The event was so hotly anticipated that we basically formed like a school fire drill safety plan to get people to the space. So if you had a ticket to this, and it had to be an extra ticket because we had to be very sure that exactly the amount of people who could go in could get in. Right. Yeah. Fire hazards galore. Exactly. We had like a volunteer come in front of your programming room and wait with you in front of the programming room to walk you in. We had to be very clear with people that nobody could form a line outside the main hallway. You would not be allowed in. You had to be in programming before the event because we didn't want to start a mob scene like was very likely so we had like volunteers show up to all the programming rooms wait at the door wait for like the right time the right high sign and then very coordinated one by one walk into the room to go and get their seats to avoid the mob scene my goodness that it would be bless all of the volunteers i'm right. sure that was stressful beyond belief and at this point leaky con was all volunteer we were all volunteer there was no mischief management it was like incorporated but we weren't employing people like it was not the operation that it is today so everybody was a volunteer at that point though certain people worked all year and then eventually most of them ended up employed for mischief that's for awesome time. my god yeah yeah and then it's a convention so we're all exhausted so i'll tell you a little secret is that during the during the show most of the staff that were in the audience watching had put on the 3D glasses and fell asleep. Oh, I would have a so thousand tired. percent done that. I am always ready to take a secret nap whenever available to. So, oh, yeah, funny. I don't blame them. Darren really worked his butt off, but you know, like all of them did. And when you saw them all backstage, and I have a lot of like videos and photos and stuff from this that we've never really put out just because of time, but the hugging and the crying, like they knew this was their the end of a really phenomenal journey. Mm -hmm. And so there was just like a lot of camaraderie and a lot of a lot of hugging and a full full prop table, full costume rack, full like their volunteers working with them to, you know, buff up Joe Walker's Voldemort chest makeup and, <laughs> you know, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like a legitimate production. When you look at the production quality of this one compared to the first two, it feels about on par with one and two. I would say it's between the two, where the second one, I, I've heard of how they got that all set up, and that was very much designed, like, we are putting on a very Potter sequel, and we are planning accordingly, and then everything worked out. And a lot of people were trying to warn me about not having too high standards for this third one, but honestly, the only real noticeable difference difference is that not everyone has all of their lines memorized and occasionally some people mess up their lines but as far as costumes to music to the songs to props to the set it feels like 
as good as the other stuff. And the only incredibly noticeable thing is just that Darren's microphone isn't working. But even that, like, they still managed to make do. And I'm very impressed. It's not easy to put together when I do a Potterless live show at LeakyCon, which is always funny when you or the Leaky team will send me an email like, what do you need? I'm like, a chair? (laughs) We appreciate that. (laughs) Trust you me. There's always the big drop down list. What required things do you need? I was like, I guess a microphone? Uh, uh, (laughs) And a guest? But yeah, I know how hard it is just to put on something as simple as me just doing a live podcast so for them to put on a full-fledged musical production that is roughly 39 hours long i think based on the youtube videos um yes, that, that, yes. it's impressive. When somebody leans over to me during it and said we're going to die here <laughs> yeah so i was told by tessa when she was on for a very potter sequel that there was an intermission put in that wasn't planned because people needed to pee what was the whole situation oh. there oh the peeing okay so <laughs> Oh, the peeing. Oh, the peeing. A very peeing senior year. is Okay. So here's what you miss on the official recording Mm -hmm. because they cleaned it up like responsible people. Good. But so now imagine this has been a ride. Like this has been a ride Mm -hmm. getting here. It's been wild. Who's here? Who's not? Who's missing this? Can we go get some people water? Can we go get some people lunch? You've got the band trying to rehearse. They're basically trying to put on as much of a full scale musical as they can. Now you have like... 30 actors wearing these lav mics, these ones that are like on their cheek, you mm-hmm. know, like like musical actors. That is not common at a convention. No, it is very no, 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 no. <laughs> no. It's incredibly complicated because the wireless nature of them means you have to deal with a lot of frequencies. And so turning on and turning off 30 different people's mics all the time was just going to be way too hard. So everybody was instructed you know, or rather wasn't instructed that their mics were just going to be left on the whole time. So when you went backstage, there was no talking. It was very quiet in the beginning. And then you're sitting out in the audience and you start hearing a little chatter in the back and you think, what's going on? And you realize, oh, somebody left their mic on. Cool. (laughs) Happens. And then there's more. And then there's a little more. And then there's shh. And then there's more (laughs) shh. As people realize that the mic was picking up. Well, what started to happen is that people had to pee. <laughs> so sitting there in the audience as you're listening to the show, we we were treated to probably every Star Kids urination <laughs> during the show. And that's exactly what you want to hear when you're in the crowd and you have to pee yourself. Hey, it's Editing Mike here. I just wanted to apologize for something that Pass Mike did here. There was an obvious joke to be made and he didn't make it and I'm really sorry. What Pass Mike should have said was, Darren Chris, more like Darren Piss, am I right? I'm very sorry that Pass Mike didn't make that joke and I just couldn't let it slide. Anyway, back to the podcast. Oh my god, <laughs> the mics were just not being turned on and it was, it, as the audience, as like the wave hit the audience that this was what was happening just like the low snickers and they're just like well live theater what are you gonna do this is what it is i forget exactly why they weren't like turned off if the actors couldn't turn them off themselves or if there just simply weren't enough text because it's so expensive there simply weren't enough text to like monitor every single person's mic to make sure it was on and off at the right time you have to match that up with like in a broadway house you have to match that up specifically with the moment they walk on and off the stage or, you know, stage managers and audio techs are well paid for a reason. And this was very much a all hands on deck, just do it. And so, yeah, no, there was a lot of fun noises in the background. I would have absolutely loved if there was a Robert Durr situation where while someone is peeing, they're like, yeah, I killed that other guy. too. That's- <laughs> <laughs> and then they solved a crime. <laughs> I wish I still had the it's possible I do somewhere. I wish I still had like the full original tracks and just like found people's tracks and find out what they were kind of chit-chatting to each other cuz it was just like a mumble you couldn't hear somewhere, you know. It was man, it was wild. Still there's so many people in the play. There are so many microphones. Credit to whoever put together this video. I'm sure it took them a million years to get the video up because it's so much to edit and so much to go in and out. And just the task alone of how do we make Darren's microphone sound as good as we can? Do you know what happened with his? Like, was it working at the convention? Was it only the recording that messed up? I think he got a bum one. I think they just never, they didn't realize that it was like, because in in the, sitting in the audience, you couldn't tell that it was Darren's mic that was a little wacky. You just heard. Oh, okay. All the audio that you're hearing is so cleaned. So when everybody else's audio was like, isolated and cleaned the way you would for a podcast too, like the way we take out noise and we do vocal compression and all that stuff. They did that for the final edit. 
And I think that's maybe when they found out that Darren's was the problem, which is like, of course, of uh, course, yeah, of, course. Of, cor- of course, the main character yeah. of all the people. It sounds a lot like he his channel was like opened up too high, like his input was too high and he was getting so much more in his mic than should have been, you know? Okay. Just the way sort of Darren was talking was kind of the experience of of watching. And so you kind of forgot about it after 10 minutes, right? Like you're when it first start, you're like, oh, this is not Broadway quality audio. That's right. I'm at a convention. That's what it's going to be. And then in 10 minutes later, you've just sort of forgot it. That's what I always try to tell people when I have guests on the show, especially if people don't have high quality microphones or if just because of the world right now, they don't have their nice setups or studios or whatever. I feel like with podcast listening, after a few minutes, you just get accustomed to it and you're okay with whatever the sound quality is. And the only time you really notice it is if you then switch to another podcast that sounds either better or worse than whatever you were listening to before. And then you're like, oh, wow, that's different. I'm sorry to, to, to do a non sequitur, but I'm just remembering going back to the scheduling Mm-hmm. It was Pottercast that was scheduled to be right after this. Very smart. Very smart. Well, no, because after like five hours, oh, there wasn't not a very soul. Smart. No, not very smart. What you should have done, and I've never thanked you for this, is that well, you should have done what you did for me, which was putting my show right before Tom Felton set at uh-huh. LeakyCon in Dallas. That was so fun sitting Gosh. there with you on that stage <laughs> and being like, yes, they're all here for us. It's just us. You all love me and <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> yeah, what I should have said is like, you go to like the second biggest room and everybody who is in that room is the first group that goes into a very Potter sequel. See if I, or, or senior year, if I had my, my thinking head on straight. <laughs> but later that night was the ball. And so if oh, you look, oh no, it's so much. Yeah, it was so we were so wrecked, but we had so much fun. Of course, you can see the relief on their faces. <laughs> I, I know the Star Kids like danced their faces off at that ball. That ball was great. Man, that's ridiculous. Well, now that we have talked on and on about the uh, the production of it, unless you have any other stories, and I'm sure they will come up as we go, shall we get into the actual play itself? Yeah, they'll come up as we go. The Good. one the one last thing is to give a little prop to Corey Lubowicz, who, when designing the set, showed me the sketch of it and showed me that Leaky Con was massive in the center of it. And I looked at him and I was like, that's a you know, that's a big choice for a very Potter uh, senior year. He's like, yes, it is. <laughs> he was very, he was very sweet. So like LeakyCon forever gets like promo in a very Potter, in a very senior. In fact, how come I can't say this right? A Bipsy uh, <laughs> forever. And I, I'm always grateful to the brilliant Corey Lubowicz for that. I mean, if they went through with doing an entire Red Vine bit about being <laughs> kind of semi-sponsored by Red Vines in the second one, right. the least they could do for all of the work that you and your team put in is have LeakyCon right big in the back of the whole video i have one more tiny little story is that not oh, the no. not the Please whole tell convention. as many as you want <laughs> <laughs> it was it's such a blur but not the whole convention was at this most of the convention was at this but there were some people who who didn't want but hard as it is to believe who didn't want to um to watch a very part of senior musical senior year and for those people marco shiro went out into the lobby and read out loud the my immortal harry potter fanfic for people. Oh, wow. That is great counter programming. That's right. very good. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love him. Okay, now I'm ready. Oh, that's a very smart play. That's okay. So, a very Potter senior year. And of course, I'm going to have to ask for another story very soon because, uh, first off, when you watch the video on YouTube, I do appreciate that Nick Lang gives this whole, hey, here's what you're about to watch, just in case, and basically giving you the warning. I much appreciated that. But the first thing this play opens with is Ivana Lynch playing the role of Luna Lovegood in the Department of Mystery. So another story time. How the hell did they get Ivana (laughs) in the mix? And how did all of this come to be? I know she's gone to Leaky Cons in the past, but that feels like a big get. Ivana is such an amazing person, and she's a very good friend. And she she had such a great time at 11 that, of course, we had to bring her back for 12. And they just asked her and she started after 2000 leaky 2011 or like right before it or something she started watching star kid and she i remember how hilarious she found it and she thought they were all just like the most creative people and how cool this all was and so they all met at 11 and became friends and so um when they asked her to do it she just said yes and i remember saying to her like wait you're playing luna and she's like yeah and i was like i didn't say anything else because i didn't want to like get her in tr- like my understanding is that you can't 
oh, do that. Right. So yeah, I just Chris let it Rankin go. Chris Rankin said that about Percy. He's right. not allowed to do that. Right. And I think Warner Brothers just sort of turned a blind eye because it was done. What can you do? Because, yeah, actually playing your character in something else is something oh, that's not really. That's really funny. Yeah. Uh, she I mean, it fits, it fits for the Avery Potter trilogy because Luna is barely established in the second. And she's mm-hmm. just a joke at the end, effectively. So it fits in really nicely that she was able to do Luna. Though it would have been very funny to see Ivana Lynch play someone that isn't Luna. Right. <laughs> like that also would have been funny. So I feel like it could have worked either way, but it did fit nicely that they hadn't really fleshed out this character. So why not have Ivana play the character she did in the films? And I met Ivana when she was 15. And so I have a very sort of now, now she's such a, 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 a beautiful and accomplished woman. Um, but I felt very like motherly to her at the time. <laughs> and so it was just I, in my little heart, I was just like, oh, please let, let us not destroy her career at LeakyCon. Let, please let, let us not destroy her career at LeakyCon. Luckily, that did not come to pass. Yeah, it seems like she's doing OK. She was on Dancing with the Stars. And yes. the, unfortunately, the last I heard of her was she made a tweet that didn't get received very well because it was a, a little pro JK-ish. And then she deleted her Twitter account. So hopefully she's all right. Yeah, I think she just wants to focus on Instagram where she can really. Got it. Twitter is such a crazy place because people get to say whatever they want to you and you can't, you can't, you have to just take it. And I don't think she finds that like a very engaging conversation. I know, I know Ivana just is so full of love and um, we're all learning how to, how to speak to people right now. And so, um, you know, everybody's just sort of dealing with things in their own way. Right. I think she meant well with her post. It wasn't as solid as some of the other Harry Potter actors posts, but I think that goes to, I know Ivana and JK have a long established relationship. So I, I can understand why it was harder for her to take more of the like screw her stance that a lot of the other people took. This is so hard for people i mean if i i've been saying to people nonstop that like this is heartbreaking and i've had a very mild relationship with jk rowling like this is really hard and when you know ivana's career started with writing letters back and forth with jk before she was luna you know mm-hmm. that story right right there's a long history there and so i think part of what happens is that people just expect such a performance out of celebrities and they're all just learning and doing their best as much as they can here but at her heart ivana is just the most loving and wonderful person that I've met through the in the cast. And so not to say that the rest of them aren't wonderful, but like obviously obviously I know Ivana better. Um and she's just she's just so good. And you know, I just hope everybody just gives her a little break because she's Yeah, I mean she seems like the type of person to actually listen and learn and understand why yes her message wasn't as well received as some of the others as opposed to the uh the the big person who we're all upset with doesn't want to listen to anyone unless that person is specifically saying you're right then That's she'll the listen to you all ears that boy do i know that it's so i can't oh my god it's so it's this is why this is wild i have <sighs> it's uh, uh-huh. another time we'll 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 dig into it heavily <laughs> because like it's just so fresh and raw and it's, yeah it's what she is doing right now is so unlike the person that I knew. And so I can understand how somebody like Ivana is like, this is, I I know this, I know this person, this is not who she is. And like, that's, and then also understand how people can rightly say, well, you, that she doesn't deserve you making that excuse for her and that's like the truth that i'm grappling with right is that like you can't say this is not this person this is this person this is what they are doing and grappling with the understanding that this is may not be a change but a revelation of who she is Mm -hmm. is very difficult for a lot of people and especially a lot of people who've had their lives shaped by her you know Yeah, I mean, it's especially disappointing because of who she is. The fact that she is author of children's novel series that a lot of people read and learned to be inclusive because of and felt welcome in a community because of it. And now she's the one of all the people like why her is kind of the thought. And I don't know, it's hard even for me, even though I've only really been a part of Harry Potter stuff for four years or so, I can't even imagine the people who grew up with this and were really shaped by it. It's hard even for me just to have her do it. It it just like, I don't know, it just makes you feel bad. It feels off to continue to make content Mm -hmm. about Harry Potter. But thankfully, I've mostly been done with the canon stuff. So it's all of fan made things. And I think that's what I'm really just trying to focus on with going forward with Potterless and not stopping it is that 
it, it's there's so much more to Harry Potter than just the books. And I've been saying this before JK went on all these Twitter tirades and stuff is that she hasn't really actively done anything good for the community in a very long time. I know that she's made Pottermore and does some other stuff and, you know, but like no one likes the Fantastic Beast movies. Cursed Child sucked. And when I think of the things that I actually like about the community, it's things like LeakyCon where you have people getting together and just being happy and all of the people making YouTube videos and fan fiction and podcasts and all this other stuff, merchandise, cosplay. There's so many other positive things. I'm just trying to focus on that as opposed to JK. Like, yes, she created the community. I don't think she has been like an active nope. force shaping it for quite some time now. So I think that's the w easiest way to try to not be so hurt by it is that she started it, but like, what has she really done to contribute in a meaningful way lately? <laughs> No, I mean, in, in a positive <laughs> in a positive meaningful way lately. <laughs> Sorry, I just you know it's it's <laughs> when I get I get bombarded right now with you're just leeching off her, you're just this and that. It is non-stop. And I just these people have no idea. I have been working for 20 full years inside the fandom. Almost all of that without any input from J.K. Rowling. There are times where she did input and it was very great, grateful. She wrote the forward to my book. I will never not be appreciative of that. But, it, you know, 20 years inside a community, that is work in and of itself. And so, yeah, there are days when I'm like, man, how can we prop up this series that she wrote because it's just giving her attention. But then I know what it's like working in this community. And why would I ever just like pull up stakes and stop, right? There's so much good and value. So many people have told me that they have found such a home through the things we do. Mm -hmm, and I'm mm -hmm. sure through listening and finding a community through Potterless, through listening to Pottercast, through listening to Mugglecast. And then what feels right to me is that, all right, well, she's going to go out and do this. What a great legacy it would be if the Harry Potter community stood up and counteracted that harm and showed a world where fandom was more tolerant and more inclusive and better. And like, look, we're not perfect. We're going to keep getting better. We haven't been perfect in a lot of ways. We had one year where we didn't do great by the trans community one year at LeakyCon where we made a couple of big mistakes, but we got called out. We listened and we fixed it and we're continuing to fix it. I'm not saying we're perfect, but like the point is that there is never a time in any creator's life or any person's life where your need to listen and learn ends. It just doesn't exist. And for her to be like on two separate tweets that go out one minute apart, be like, praising a child and bringing them into her world for their art about her story and then tweeting out how certain children are just deluded for their own lived experience that must be counteracted and if not the harry potter community then who right i'm not perfect either and i think what else is very upsetting about jk is that she she's always tried to act like she was this perfect person and like never made a mistake ever and we would just if you would just show some sort of willingness to listen to someone else and change accordingly. I've listened to people where I didn't think I was in the wrong and I heard what they had to say. And then for thinking about it, I realized I was in the wrong and I've changed. There's older episodes of Potterless where I've used language that I'm not proud of. There's jokes I've made that I'm not proud of. Someone made a good point that with all of the stuff going on, I'd spoken up about racial stuff and trans stuff, but I hadn't really said anything about the anti-Semitism because, you know, it's 2020 and everything has to be bad. <laughs> At first, when they reached out to me, I was upset because I was like, hey, I've been very vocal about calling out anti-Semitism that JK has throughout the series. And they said, yeah, but you haven't said anything recently. And I was like, okay, true, good call. And then I yeah. made sure that I said something about it. So I think that you would just hope that she could listen. And you make a good point that you never get the chance to stop. Like just because you did a good thing in the past doesn't mean you get a free hall pass forever and that you don't have to change because things that seem good and progressive 20 years ago don't necessarily work out 20 years later and you have to adapt and all it takes is an apology, but it just doesn't seem like she's going to get there. No, I think I finally reconciled that that is, you know, that quote, when people show you who they are, believe them. Ooh. She is showing us who she is and it is somebody who does not who really truly believes that she is right in this mm -hmm. and isn't making any room for the fact that it is undeniable that she is actively hurting people and telling people that she knows their lives better than they do so i know that we're like on a tangent but it's just we're all working through this together and so i think you know like right. it's fair and it's valid but it, this is hard and this is gonna be hard for a while and i'm so i'm also like i'm really grateful to you for being straight up 
like <laughs> really just like screw it let's go what do we got to do so speak against it what we got to do we gotta, i want you want i got you got a statement i'll put out the statement too let's go let's do it you've just been very game i want to do anything i can help i mean as i said on twitter and stuff i came into the harry potter community actively wanting to dunk <laughs> on harry potter my entrance did into- you think it was going to be a hate you thought it was gonna be like a hate read i didn't think it was gonna be a hate read but if you listen to the early episodes of potter i'm so much snarkier than ah. i was it was more of me like not necessarily just shitting on it but i thought that the bigger overall tone of the show was going to be me trying to find all the things that didn't make sense and pointing them out and then people going oh i never thought of it that way i thought it was going to be like that so verging on critical and then humorous along the way i did not think that a running bit of the show would be how much i loved a character or how dramatically i fell for a red herring or the fact that i got obsessed with silly things like them calling the color purple violently purple (laughs) one time Mm -hmm. or they changed the name to a thing and i'm passionate i did not not think any of what the show is going to be about was me being passionate about something. So the fact that the Harry Potter community to me, someone coming in in the first couple episodes being like, lol, these books are overrated and silly. I'm going to make fun of them. The fact that the community was still accepting to me and just was sitting back with their arms crossed saying, yeah, he'll turn around. The <laughs> fact that that is what the Harry Potter community stands for. I feel like I owe it to go back to the Harry Potter community. And if anyone is going to attack them, even if it's the person who made it themselves, I'm going to push back and do whatever I can. So yes, I'm very open to trying to do whatever I can to help. And I also realize that I'm a cis white straight dude. Mm-hmm. So I have to listen. I can't be the one to be like, I know what to do because spoiler alert, I fucking don't. Look at that. So I'm just going to let people tell me what Look at I that. should do. Mike, you're alive. You said those things and you're still here breathing. It's Ooh. almost like it can be done. Whoa. <laughs> like, whoa. People are canceling me. I still have 14 million Twitter followers. Don't even what are I going to do? Start me on that goddamn letter. <laughs> Oh <laughs> my God, canceling. <laughs> Don't even start me on all the things they should have talked about in that letter. You want to talk about you're worried about cancel culture? How about you worry about all these publications start to hire in a diverse way that represents all viewpoints? And then you get to talk about who is canceled and who is not. Oh, pay equity. How about we start talking about pay equity? Can you imagine if she just never used Twitter? We would all think she's the greatest she person. She used to not use Twitter. <laughs> and we all, we like complained about it a little bit. And there is a, there's a thread. I got to go find it. There's a thread between me and Maureen Johnson when she, when she said something about wishing that Joe would Twitter. I'm like, nah, I kind of wish she would write, meaning like I want more of her books. She's like, no, Melissa, it'd be great. Make it happen. You know her. I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. Boy, was I right. Oh, man. <laughs> the right side of history, Melissa and Ellie. The right side of history. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I watched Hamilton for the first time a couple weeks ago when it released on Disney Plus. But the line in the play where they say, have you ever seen someone try to ruin their own life? Right. Is feeling incredibly pertinent right now. It hit real hard. That hit real hard when I watched Hamilton. <laughs> ever seen someone, have you read this? It's like, what, do you know how easy it is not to be transphobic or at least not to actively be transphobic it's like it's very easy to shut up you know how easy it is to ask someone to proofread a tweet i had a tweet today come out it is tax day the time that we were recording this i had a tweet where i this was my first time really on a significant scale paying taxes for being a self-employed independent creator and i got hit hard by those taxes baby and i was making a tweet semi complaining about that and i ran it by julie at multitude i said hey is this okay like this isn't going to be insensitive right because i like the taxes fun things like education and stuff but also this is annoying and she was like no you're good it's very easy to double check i don't think there's a single person that jk rowling's like hey How's this tweet? And then someone would have been like, don't do that. Right. <laughs> That's really bad. It's also real easy to apologize. Do you know how easy? Like, I accidentally oh my gosh. like It's two words. It's two so words, easy. three syllables. It's so easy. I like this tweet by Matt Schlapp one day. I don't know. Because I was reading this. Twitter's so dumb. As you scroll with your right hand, you're right over the mm-hmm. heart button, which is dumb. So you do accidentally like tweets. That happens. And so I was reading this horrific thread that he had started. And I accidentally liked the tweet. And like a couple hours later, one of my employees was like, um, I may be overstepping, but um, you know, you liked this tweet. I was like, no, <laughs> of course I didn't mean to like this tweet. So that had just been sitting there. So I tweeted. I was like, hey, just so you know, that was an accident. I will never like a tweet from that fool on purpose. And a couple of people were like, I saw it. I just, I wasn't sure. Like, I was like, okay, she's entitled to her opinion. I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) Anyway, the world is a trash fire and it's very easy to Mm -hmm. shut up. And it's also, you know, she started this in the middle of a global reckoning on racial injustice, which is like. And on the third day of Pride Month. Yeah. Real, real class. That's real class. 
right there. I'm ready. I'm really excited for Arbor Day when she's like, fuck trees. <laughs> I hate them. <laughs> That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> So now that we've ended this on a happy note, let's let's talk yeah. about. <laughs> we've gotten two lines into my notes about a very. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's so, it's just, no, this is perfect. This is everything I wanted. And this was inevitable. We have to talk about Joe. You know what, past Melissa, you are correct. And you know what else is inevitable? Me, Thanos. Just kidding. Editing, Mike. We have to take a little bit of a break here for when Guardian Madridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Sunsoil. Let's say hypothetically that you are Darren Chris and the Star Kids getting ready to perform a very Potter senior year, and you need to get as much sleep as you can when you have the opportunity to do so. So you want something to help you calm yourselves down and get to sleep quickly. What could help with that? CBD oil from Sunsoil. Sunsoil makes CBD oil that is USDA certified organic. They grow the hemp on their farms in Vermont, and they never use pesticides or herbicides, which are great because I wouldn't want those in my body. Sunsoil keeps it simple, and most of their CBD products have just two simple ingredients, coconut oil and hemp, which are things I'm okay with being inside of my body. Kelly and I have both been using the CBD oil from Sunsoil. Ours is cinnamon flavored, which is fun, and we really like it. It just helps us fall asleep quickly and we sleep through the night soundly and we've had no problems with it. It's been a great experience. What's also nice is that we're about to run out and Sunsoil is surprisingly affordable. Since they farm their own hemp and they stick to simple ingredients, they offer high quality CBD at a price that can be half of other brands. Kelly and I didn't know a whole lot about CBD oil before we started using them. We looked into Sunsoil on their website and they are fantastic because their products are simple, they are transparent about their ingredients, and they are dedicated to being clean and sustainable, so that made us feel comfortable with using their product. Sunsoil makes pure and simple CBD products at an unbeatable price, and you can get 30% off your first order if you go to sunsoil.com slash potterless. That is S-U-N-S-O-I-L dot com slash potterless to get 30% off your first order. So go to sunsoil.com slash potterless, get some CBD products, save money while you're doing so, and get the rest you need whenever you can get that rest today. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by BetterHelp. Let's say hypothetically that you are Darren Chris and you've got a whole lot on your schedule and you're trying to figure out if you can do your new Glee casting stuff as well as whatever else you got going on in addition to performing in a very Potter senior at LeakyCon. You're stressed. You want to talk to someone about it. Who could you talk to? A licensed professional with BetterHelp. If there's something in your life that is interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp can help you by assessing your needs and matching you with your own licensed professional therapist. With that therapist, you can start communicating in under 48 hours you can reach out whenever it makes the most sense for you. They will respond with timely and thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly video calls or phone calls, whatever works best for your schedule. BetterHelp is very flexible and that's what makes them great. Their service is available for clients worldwide. And since they have such a broad range of experts, it could be something that you wouldn't normally be able to reach locally. And the fact that you do it from home is nice because you can take your calls from the comfort of your own home and you don't have to deal with things like awkward waiting rooms and therapists office and stuff that I would assume aren't the most comfortable. It also is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. They also make it easy and free of charge to change your therapist if it's not a great match. They're dedicated to making sure that the person that you are matched with is right for you. And you don't have to just take my word for it. You can go to betterhelp.com slash reviews and you can see what other people who are using BetterHelp are saying about it. And as a Potterless listener, you can go to betterhelp.com slash Potterless. Betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Potterless. You can join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health and you will get 10% off your first month. So again, that is betterhelp.com slash Potterless. You'll get 10% off your first month and start talking to someone about your very stressful life today. So in case you forgot where we left off, we've covered a whole lot in that Luna is here. That's Luna's what we've discussed here. so far. First line. <laughs> Luna is yeah. here at the Department of Mysteries. That was a big secret. That oh, she was yeah? in it was a giant secret. Okay. Yeah. How? How? Of course, we have to go on more tangents. How? Since you didn't know the Darren stuff, wh how public were you about him being there or not being there? And then was was Luna complete secret the whole time? Because the audience freaked out, which made it very much seem like yeah. it was not known. We were public about Darren being there. We got like the final confirmation, even though we were all nervous about that, but we still used it—the confirmation that like Darren was coming. I personally, and I think I said this to people at the time, was like, I will believe it when he is in the building. And he was, and he was, he made it into the building you know that morning um but yeah no ivana being in the show at all was a massive secret um so that was a real fun payoff oh that's super fun so neville runs in and i gotta say the actor who played neville puberty did very well for him which i think is very funny because it also did the same for og neville for uh matt lewis so you know i guess it's just part of the territory of being neville is that you go through puberty very well and it does good things for you yeah and do you know about the um the Hermione? Because I know like Hermione's like the next 
big entrance. Yes, she is a change of actress. So what happened there? Bonnie Grusin, who played the original in the first two, was not interested in continuing with Star Kids. Whoa. So as far as I know, like that that is my understanding of what it was. So she was, just wasn't interested. I know she did something with them uh, for the anniversary, the 10 year. But so they had a recast. So they recast Mer- Meredith Stepien, who is now married to Brian Holden. Oh, wow. Yeah, they they met, fell in love and are happy little comedic buddies <laughs> together in husband and wife. Them. So yeah, that I love that they pulled this whole like, she broke her nose before she took her mask off. It's like, <laughs> hey, I don't want to tell you. I don't want to. Don't freak out, but you look hot. <laughs> you know? And she's like, I may look different, but I am the same. I, I sh- you should treat me exactly that because it was very, people got so attached to Bonnie. Rightly so. She was amazing. Mm-hmm. And so they were very worried. And with misogyny the way it is, obviously, I think I think everybody in Stark, it was very, very worried that Meredith would be like the focus of real fierce division, you know? Yeah. But she has proven over and over and over again just what an asset she is to that group and so um it was nice to see her warmly welcomed that's good and good for her i always appreciate when people are recast either you make a joke of it and you make it very obvious that they're doing it rather than try to sweep it under the rug but it's also fun to see it done in professional real movies and stuff when they have to do it but they can't make a joke of it my favorite example of this is in the dark knight when they have the new rachel Uh, And it's Maggie Gyllenhaal instead of, what's the other person? Katie Holmes? Tom Cruise's wife? Mm -hmm. Are they still married? Mm -hmm. What are celebrities? I don't think they are. Are, Yeah. The only time I learn about their relationship is when I'm checking out at the grocery store. And it's like, their kid is an astronaut now. Like, whatever's going on. But my favorite thing in The Dark Knight is when they show Rachel. They say the name Rachel roughly 18 million times, I think. (laughs) They're like, oh, look, it's Rachel. And then they show a picture of Rachel. And they're like, oh, Rachel? Yes, Rachel. You remember Rachel? Yes, Rachel. (laughs) It's so good. Might that be Rachel? That's funny. I haven't seen The Dark Knight in forever. You should look out for that next time you watch it, but they're just one step shy of her coming in with a name tag that says, hello, my name is Rachel, when she walks into the scene. That's funny. That's a, that's essentially what they did here with Meredith. Yeah, I, I like that they didn't try to act like it wasn't a recast. They went right into it, and whether the whole you're hot now joke, I hope Bonnie doesn't feel bad about that. Like, I'm sure it's not directed at her. I hope she does not interpret it that way. I don't think it is. I think it's a mix of... They they're very mean to Hermione. Uncomfortably so. Yes, uncomfortably so. And it's like, okay, we're putting that joke away. Also a nod to book seven Ron, who did find Hermione very attractive. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it was like a like a mix. I mean, it's also the book four thing. I, I Looking back, it's sad to look back now at some of the things that happen in Harry Potter now that we see some of JK's true colors. Do you mean and, the staircases that change according to gender? Uh, that's not great. I didn't think about that one, but fuck me. <laughs> the thing, though, is just that book four has very much the stereotype of, oh, the girl isn't wearing glasses and put her hair up now, so now she's hot and thus has value. Like, that's the Goblet of Fire thing is, right. oh, Hermione put on a dress and her teeth aren't as big anymore (laughs) though i will i will point out i'll point out that one of my favorite things about that is that ron is the only person who never comments about her appearance oh i didn't notice that that's really good because everybody else is so gobsmacked by how hermione looks and because he's so mad about crumb you get the appearance there's like the patina of him being gobsmacked by how she looks but there's not a single piece of textual <sighs> evidence that shows he was affected by it at all i'm just gonna add that to my bank of ron is underrated totally and <laughs> just keep it in there <laughs> the biggest crime of that and i didn't even realize this until i saw a meme of it shout out to people sharing memes on the potterless facebook group there was one where it showed the line in the book i didn't even know they changed this in the movie where Snape calls out Hermione for being a know-it-all. And in the book, Ron stands up for her and says, Uh you asked her a question and she answered it. What else did Uh you expect? And then in the movie, he says he has kind of a Uh point though. What is that, David Yates? Have you ever heard my big Ron rant? No, but- I'm going to find it for you. It went like weirdly like Tumblr viral because somebody like typed it out like back in the day. Last time I saw it, it had like 150,000 or something retweets because, or retumbles. What do they call it? I don't know what it is. Reblogs. I used Tumblr for roughly six months when YouTube was my big thing and the whole situation of YouTube in 2010 was just use every social media. That's why I signed up for Pottermore when it came out because I didn't know maybe that was going to be a social media and I wanted to get the username Shubes, which I did. Nice. But I... Uh, 
<laughs> Everyone with the last name Schubert tries to get it. I have to stop all these Germans that keep taking my profiles that I want. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a period in there in which we were all using the Tumblr. Right. I just lost it once because the way Ron is treated in the movies is absolutely atrocious. completely unconscionable. It's atrocious. So is Hermione too, though. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Hermione too. They made her glamorized. They made her perfect. And they assassinated her character yeah. over it because she's she's imperfect. That's so beautiful. I want that so much more mm-hmm. than this glossy, perfect. Like like Hermione gets Hermione jumps on the back of the dragon with no fear. Hermione says Voldemort's uh, name in the middle of, uh, of the, she's twelve years old and she's spouting Voldemort's name in the middle of a bookshop. Okay, Dumbledore. And then one of the biggest things they take all of Ron's like knowledge and give it to Hermione when Harry can speak Parcel Tongue. Who says anything about it? Hermione, who would have no reason to know that that's weird in the wizarding world. They give it to Hermione. If you want to kill Harry, you have to come for us too. They give it to Hermione. I I could go on this thing forever, but the biggest thing is exactly what you just said, is that Ron never, ever, ever, even when he hated Hermione, would have said that to Snape Mm -hmm. or would have like agreed with Snape. And he was really mean to her that once. And that like ended in their friendship, you know, like, but he was only talking to Harry at the time. He would have never said he has a point. Yeah. Oh, don't even Ugh. start me. It's awful. It's awful. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, no, it's great. Tangent land. <laughs> so Luna uses a disposable camera when she is with Neville. And I love that they are bringing in 90s references. It's one of my things that I think is such a missed opportunity in the Harry Potter series. So I love to see 90s stuff come through. Same. It was really cute. Mm-hmm. But like, just like Luna, the idea of... She's like this, like sort of casual sociopath in this play. <laughs> and she like appears later on. It's like, oh, you're washing blood off your yep. hands too. Clear <laughs> the chambers up and cool. Like Luna's just like really weird and 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 off in like a really like in in like a funny arch comedy way. I'm not like yeah. It's what they did to Luna is similar of what they did to Lupin in a very Potter sequel, where you make it this extreme version that almost has no similarities to the original character, but it's still very funny. And it's especially funny here because Ivana is playing her, but she's very different. Yeah. And it's it's just such a delight to see Evie stretch her wings that way. <laughs> so she then starts to sing a song. And is Ivana a singer of any sorts? I, I'm wondering if she knew what she was getting into with having to do musical. I don't know if she has a singing background. Like she sounded fine, not not necessarily on par with these other people who are professional musical makers. Uh, no, I don't think she has a singing background at all. Okay. But she was still down to do it, which is great. Totally. And worked really hard with them all week. And I also appreciate that the actual song that she starts to sing and then other people join in is very much like, we are done. This is the end. We're not making any more <laughs> Harry Potter things. Right. This it's is it. very clear. Like, we're done. We're done. We're not doing this. We're done. It's it. It's over. It's the end. Also, who told them to run throughout the whole first <laughs> number? It's like if there's like a, the no, like a number one thing that it's hard to do when you're singing is to move and especially to run is what I hear because I can't sing. Oh, I, I can't sing either. I don't know how people do it. I get out of breath when I just do my introductions to Potterless Live where I dance around and stuff. I don't know how Beyonce and BTS and all these other people do full dancing routines where they sing at the same time. I can't even yeah, sing no if idea. I'm sitting. No idea. These people are so talented. It's sick. It's bananas. Their cardio and their uh-huh. respiratory systems are out of this world. Mm-hmm. I bet Beyonce can hold her breath for 30 minutes. Do you ever see you ever see Lizzo on stage? I haven't seen her live in person, but I've seen videos of her perform live, and it's ridiculous that she can sing that much, move around, and then also play the flute. It's a level of breath <laughs> that I, yeah, I don't understand. Bananas. So the Death Eaters then enter, and so do Fenrir Greyback, and <laughs> Fenrir has established that they are in between their sixth and seventh year. He then gets his hand on a great artifact, which at first I thought, oh, that looks like the diary, but they've gone way past book two stuff. This wouldn't be about the diary. Spoiler alert, it is. So (laughs) he doesn't actually say what it is, but he goes on about wanting to eat Neville and Luna, and he says that it'll be a nice little weirdo sandwich with a side of moron, and then Ron goes, did somebody say Ron? And that, oh man, what, that's incredible. (laughs) And it's also such a callback. Like they set it up to be like, the Ron, did somebody say Ron? You know, Hmm. it's a perfect Joey Richter moment. It's great. Joey Richter comes on sporting a absolutely fantastic jacket. Right. Do we know the history of those jackets? They look like just nice jackets that they put patches on. They don't look like officially made merch. No, it's just like June is so amazing at costuming. And so I think they just like sourced a lot of oh. stuff and did what they could do with it. I love Darren's like the kind of like slick Harry and uh-huh. yeah, Ron's, like the- Ron and Harry's jackets are very fresh. They're very like varsity boys. <laughs> yeah, right it's, now. it's very it's they're good. The, the jackets are old school, cool looking 
Yeah, it's a very varsity vibe without being a literal letterman's jacket. Totally. So Ron comes in and he breaks them out. And then this is where we have Hermione coming in. She's got a Death Eater mask on. The way that they explain her casting changes that she gets hits in the face and that her nose is broken. And uh, one thing I do appreciate is that they didn't really have to do this for Bonnie because I think her hair could naturally get very frizzy. But the wig situation for this recast of Hermione... (laughs) is very funny because it's just very clear that she just has truly wild extensions put on top of her head yeah there's a lot there were a lot of wigs back there (laughs) a lot walking back there and i i went back there a bunch because it was like i can do this so i'm just (laughs) allowed (laughs) so i just i just kind of walked around back there a lot during the show um yeah the wig situation was intense especially joe walker's oh yes oh yes so they run away from the death eaters but then fenrir captures hermione but then harry potter enters to boisterous applause as he uses Expelliarmus, which is perfect because how fitting, it's Harry Potter, it's the only spell he knows, but the crowd loses their collective minds, which makes sense. It's Darren Chris. And I think, like me, they weren't sure he was in the building until he showed up on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we had we had security for him anticipating, you know, needing it, but he... He just was very chill. He didn't care. That is awesome. Traveled with his back and that was it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's got a cool jacket, much better hair situation going on. He duels Fenrir and then hits Fenrir with the Jelly Legs Jinx, classic star kid, and he runs away. And then the wizard cops enter, which I love that this joke that's been alluded to finally becomes realized with people wearing the classic aviator glasses, but then also the British whatever those hats are. I like the combo of the two stereotypes. I also liked and appreciated that while it is problematic to have cops, like in general, yeah, especially like cops now, are triggering, and especially now, but they're also they're not portrayed as as good, and it's also pointing out that Harry growing up becoming a cop essentially is problematic, and it's like it's so it makes no sense. It the more I think about it, sense. the least sense it makes. His joy was teaching Dumbledore's army. Why did he not become the defense against the dark arts professor? Right? Have to wonder. He also has the most experience of anyone with fighting dark arts since he did it every year for seven years i don't get how he becomes anything else except for the dada professor i don't get it you also think that he would hate it you'd think like he he often says how much he hates it so like the actual doing it actually so why not teach you Mm -hmm. know what i mean there's a lot of question about where he landed that i'm relooking at through a 2020 lens Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The world is fun. So Kingsley Shacklebolt then enters, and he is the minister, which I love. He's the chief of the wizard cops, which, sure, I guess. But he also has an eye patch, which I think is fun. And he's got very much the vibe of the movie Black Dynamite from 2009, where he's very much like that old school black kung fu kind of calling everyone a jive turkey situation, which I don't know about the problematic nature of it, so I'm not going to try to act like I know if this is cool or not, but if you're going to give it to anyone, it's, I think, fun to make it Kingsley. I am happy to be corrected if that is not okay. Yeah, I don't don't know either. I'll say that this is a stereotype that exists, so that's probably like, and it probably was a mix between the actors and the writer's choice here. I'll say that I did cringe at the only person of color on stage being held captive. By a white man holding a gun. Oh no! That was oh, that was uh, that was not a great moment for me in rewatching oh, this. No. Not for other people oh, in rewatching this, probably aye. a moment that was. But you know, th- this was 2012, and we were less aware than we are now. Right but now, looking at it through like the lens of you know learning and thinking and whatnot, and thinking. Oh, yeah, this that's not great. That's not great. Mm-hmm. I, I think that Star Kid, knowing what they're doing now, especially they raised just a ton oh, yeah. of money for Black Lives Matter last week. So yeah. I think that they would have totally understood. I mean, that's the biggest thing with all of this is we're not trying to, when we say things like it's 2012, we weren't aware, we're not trying to excuse it. We're saying that we want to learn from it and we hope that people do. And Star Kid for sure did. Yeah. And I don't like, like, I'm not like saying it to be like, oh man, those, those Star Kids. Oh, right. I, I think that they, like so many worthwhile creators, are looking at their work and being like, yeah, there's some problematic stuff in here. And you know Mm -hmm. what? We're listening and we're going to get better. And that's why it's so cool that we can sit here and say like, hey, yeah, this was problematic and know that they'll be like, yeah, that was problematic. Sorry, we're going to do better. Right. We just want our creators to be open to admitting fault and guilt and being okay to try to adapt forward. And Starkid does it and we would love it if somebody else would just do it too. Just, just, just the one, you know, I'll just, I'll just, come on. 
I know. I know. And it's just not going to happen. And it's Mm-mm. like a big heartbreak Mm-mm. of Harry Potter. Oh. So Mad-Eye Moody then gets in the mix <laughs> and he is apparently who let the ministry know what was happening. But then it's a very quick reveal from Harry that it's actually Barty Crouch Jr. And as you mentioned, he has a gun. He takes Kingsley hostage. Hey. But then Barty Crouch Jr. And I do appreciate him and a couple of actors do this. He's pretty much off book. He's got the script, but he's not really reading off yeah. of it. So I thought that was nice. Yeah. He gives Kingsley back and puts the gun down and challenges Harry to a man-to-man fight and then Hermione steps up and uses stupefy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and sure enough, no, it's not enough. It's never enough when it's no, Hermione. Of course not. It's, uh, it's, yeah. So then Kingsley tries to recruit Harry for the wizard cops, but Harry turns it down because he has to go and do his senior year at Hogwarts. And the next scene after this is Molly waking up all of the Weasleys at the burrow on September 1st. That's about to be the first day of school. Like a New Jersey mother. Mm -hmm. She's got all her kids in the house and she's just trying to make them ready for school, you know? Like, I love it. It's a great, it's a great bit voice to have for Molly. Like if Molly wasn't a British woman, she would definitely be very similar to New Jersey mother that insists that you eat five rounds of plates for dinner, etc. You know, grab you say like you look away. skinny. You yeah, look so exactly. skinny. Would you just eat a bagel? What are they feeding you at that school? Do I have to talk to the dean My about getting goodness. you on a meal plan? You're not eating. <laughs> exactly. You could just come back and live with me after graduation. I'll do your laundry. <laughs> I'll do your laundry. Exactly. It's it was so it was a great sort of slot to pick, and she played it so well. It's wonderful. So Ginny is back, which makes me happy because she wasn't really in a Harry Potter sequel, and she officially says Harry's her boyfriend. So that. Is cool. And then we have a great line from Molly where she goes, We've got all these extra people in our house Bill's wife, Ron's girlfriend, Harry's girlfriend. I'm swamped. Exactly. Exactly. All like, all like non family members. (laughs) It's so great. It's like, there's a lot of cool little subtlety. I think this is, that's one of those moments. Like Mm -hmm. re watching this reminded me just how good and subtle their writing can really be sometimes. You know? Yes. I think that this one, at least from what I've seen so far, is. They are doing the most of the jokes that I like, which are things like this, where you're making a joke. It's not over the top. You're not kind of like, hey, hey, get it, get it, get the joke we just made. And also just steering clear of stuff that could be seen as offensive. I haven't really been turned off by any of the jokes significantly. Sure, there's some that aren't great, but so far from what I've seen in this first act, there's nothing where I was, it it felt incredibly uncomfortable watching it. I think it was mostly fine. I'll say that it has changed remarkably from the first one. There's a signs of growth. Oh, yes. So much. So much. Yeah. Can we talk for just like a second about the absolute sheer delight that is Jamie Lynn Beatty? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. She is. She plays Ginny and she is just, first of all, her voice is out of this world. Oh, yes. The inspiration for me watching other Starkid stuff is I want to find one where she is a main character that doesn't have to play. Because the way they do Ginny is a very like ditzy kind of aloof girl. I want to see something where she is a competent normal person because her voice is stunning her voice is stunning but she also is a very quirky out of this world kind of person and she's very funny she's a very funny comedian and and it's she's just i have nothing but respect for that woman's talent and i think that one day she's going to explode and we should all keep an eye on her we should we should so Ginny goes upstairs to get ron and there are other Weasley family members that show up. Did they recast Charlie and made it Charlotte? I was confused of what that That's was. That's the Cho Chang actress, Devin. It's just, she's just playing Charlie. Oh, okay. It sounded like they said Charlotte, not Charlie. Maybe I just I, misheard. Oh, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's just Charlie. Okay, I hope so. Because me as eternal, I'm defending Charlie Weasley. And I think that his erasure is completely unfair and unjustified. I was like, really? We can't even get Charlie in this? Right. No, no, no. I think, I think that was, I think it's still Charlie. I hope I just misheard it. So then Fleur and Bill are also there. And then so is Percy. And I love the Percy depiction of someone that (laughs) hates Percy. It's just, oh, so so crotchety and grumpy and cranky. It's absolutely fantastic. He can't fix the (laughs) Wi-Fi. It's great. (laughs) <laughs> he's absolutely on reddit mm, it's wonderful the fam tries to get ron to be romantic to hermione apparently ron is struggling with the fact that hermione hasn't kissed him in a very long time and he's very upset about this and while he's talking about this harry enters and i love the narrator edition in this play the narrator is very fun and one of the things the narrator says when harry comes in is just then harry surfs into the room on a heart-shaped guitar powered by rose petals because ron had just said something like not wanting to do like 
cheesy things, you know, and Harry surfs into the room. And also, I love that Starkid relentlessly makes fun of Darren. Oh, yes. They are merciless about it. And he's game, so it's it's all cool. But Darren has a swagger to him. Darren's always, before Darren was famous at all, he had that swagger to him. It's just like sort of a part of his personality, you know? So they're just ripping him for it in this. It's, it's super fun to watch. It's very, very fun indeed. So Darren then sings a very bad, very rushed I Love You Ginny song, and she absolutely yeah. <laughs> loves it, head over heels for it. Harry gives her a gift, and it's revealed that it's what they got from the ministry, that artifact, and they let you know that it actually is the diary. So Ron asks Harry if he's all ready to go back to school, and he says yes, except that he can't find his lucky snitch with the inscription that says, I open at the close, whatever the fuck that means, <laughs> which, oh, I love it. I love it so much. Whatever that means. Yeah. Great. It's great. That's oh, fantastic. Hermione comes in saying that she's just finished another young adult series. The heroine falls for the doughboy next door. Another perfect ending. The Hunger Games by Gilderoy Lockhart, which so I great. thought was just going to be a throwaway joke, but then he actually becomes a main character, which I think is fantastic. It's so great. Do you, do you know, I have all these extra props from them that they made for this oh, in cool. my closet. And then I'm going to start giving them away because they're just sitting in my closet. I'm going to start giving mm -hmm. them away on like my Instagram or something. I don't know. But I've got like an album of Gilderoy's music that they made. Oh, like it's just like an album cover. So they didn't make the actual like music. Yeah. But yeah there's yeah. like a country album cover. Like oh, they went man. to town on this. You could do it as little charity giveaway things where you just kind of put up auctions and stuff. I'm sure people would love it and then just donate the money to a charity or something. That's an excellent idea. I'm gonna do yeah. That. I was going to do that with, um, Completely by accident, I started taking notes in my Harry Potter books when I was making episodes of Potterless. I started doing that with book six, which, of course, is the story that features a book where someone writes inside the margins. So one of these days, I'm going to do a charity thing where people just like, if you just send me a receipt of you donating somewhere, like each dollar will count as like a ticket. And then I'll just do like a random number generator and then send that book to someone. You can do something amazing. like that. So. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that going. So Ron and Harry ask who Gilderoy Lockhart is. Hermione says that he is her favorite author and idol. He's apparently the author of the Twilight series. <laughs> the Hunger Games, <laughs> and Percy Jackson and whatever he did. Yes, Percy Jackson and whatever he did. Who, if we want to stand an author who knows how to change and grow Dude. and oh, has man. representation, let's talk about Rick Riordan. I know some of his stuff is problematic. but like, Yeah, I've heard that some of his stuff isn't the best, but he owns up to it, which is nice and what all we ask. I've had people emailing me for years and years that I should do a Percy Jackson series, and I was always like, I don't know. like I don't just want to be the guy that reads stuff for the first time. But now that I see all of the great tweets from Rick, I'm like, and couple that with all the bad JK stuff, doing a Percy Jackson reads looking real promising. Yeah, no shade on Percy Jackson. I loved Percy Jackson, mm. but way back when I first came out. Fish Jackson was great. I just gave them to my nephew. Mm, mm, nice. That's very fun. Instead of Harry Potter. Oh, I mean, yep. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry says, Twilight. Oh, I've heard of that. I don't like how those books objectify men. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's one of my favorite moments in the whole thing. Very good. I love it. And then him and Hermione have a bit of a back and forth. Hermione says, have you ever read them? Have you ever read a book? And then Harry says, have you ever not read a book? And Hermione goes, no. <laughs> it's great. It's, again, that, that is the kind of joke that is just really subtle, you know? It's overtly done. It's like bigly done. But that to think of that of that turnaround, like if you've not read a book, it's great. It's really solid. Hermione says she can't stand people who don't read. She asks Ron if he read it. Ron very clearly didn't. He starts stammering. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and then he tries to turn it into an argument with Hermione. He says, it's about a hungry girl who won't kiss her boyfriend. And then <laughs> Hermione goes, you did read it. <laughs> Which, oh man, as someone that stopped reading the second Hunger Games because Katniss was being so mean to PETA, I totally appreciated this joke. Have you not read the third Hunger Games? So I read the first one. I got up to the second one at the point where she was just being so mean to PETA on the train on the tour that I stopped. And then during quarantine, Kelly and I watched the movie so that I would know the rest of the story. So I know everything that happened. I just couldn't read that book. She was so mean to PETA that it frustrated me so much that I stopped reading it. It was just stressing me out. That series I reread and upon rereading felt very strongly that it's a masterpiece. Mm, yeah, I mean, the story is great. I just didn't enjoy Katniss as narrator 
And I'm sure as I would have read a couple more chapters, I would have got over it. I just really couldn't get over how rude she was to him. He's so nice well, and wholesome. Well, it's like Harry Book 5. I guess, yeah. And honestly, I, I would have stopped reading Book 5 if I was on Megan Potter list. I never would have got past Chapter 5 or whatever. There's just so much about what people do to people that they perceive as a hero. You know, mm-hmm. what people do to people when they ask too much of them. What what the weight of the world does to a person. And there, there's a lot of parallels there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Fred and George enter. Fred is already dead. So the timeline of this is very oh, confusing. It. It's just, just it. out the it's window. A, it's Stark it has like all the Harry Potter plots in a box. And it's like they went <laughs> through the box and we're like, here are the ones we used in one. Here are the ones we used in two. Here are the plots we didn't use that are in Harry Potter, but haven't been yet used in a Potter musical. Cool. These are the ones we have to work with. <laughs> and that's how, like, the chamber got in here and everything else. It's ridiculous. So then Arthur gives Ron the keys to the flying car, and they set off to Hogwarts. And I think that is the perfect ending for this first episode covering a Harry Potter senior year. So, Melissa, thank you so much for joining on, giving behind-the-scenes info, letting me get some JK stuff off my chest, also talking about a Harry Potter <laughs> senior year for just, like, a little bit at the very end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if people want to find you doing stuff online, where can they do so? Oh, so much stuff. There's there's Pottercast, which we are figuring out right now because of J.K. Rowling mm-hmm. the way she's being. You should just complete rebrand, only talk about pottery. Only pottery. It's about pottery. pottery it's cast. about the movie Ghost. It's about planting stuff. It's about planting weed. Stuff. Anything. It's, it's about, about cooking, weed. like buying pots and pans. You should do, just do a oh, different episode it. about different uses of the word pot. <laughs> I love it. I love it. A podcast. That's I'm the sure podcast. Will love, will love that. <laughs> It's the podcast. That has to exist, right? That has to yeah. be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that one's for sure about weed. Yours that can still sure. be Potter cast. And then it's just like the pot saga as you try to figure out what to do. You just talk about all the, <laughs> all the etymology of the word pot. <laughs> but where I'm having, where we're having, like, honestly, as a Harry Potter fan, where I'm having the most fun right now is on roll nine and three quarters, which yeah. is Harry Potter D&D. Oh. <laughs> and so Frack, one day, literally just out of nowhere, one day said to me and John, I have this idea about how to turn D&D into a Harry Potter story because he's been playing it for years and none of the rest of us, me, John, or Bree, who was John's uh, fiance but now uh, joined us for this, had ever played it before. So we're like discovering D&D together. It's really ridiculous. John, the in the last episode, John healed our enemies. We're like in the middle of a fight and John just decides, now nah, I'm going to heal. It's really fun. It's really fun. And we're hoping soon to start having other people on so i i really want to get you on it because i think we'll have a lot of fun together i would love to get in the mix i've always wanted to do a harry potter DD. i thought it would be a very fun thing to do like a one shot of sorts at a leaky con so the fact that you guys are doing it is great and i would all i am always down to guest and come in and awesome. do some silly improv and flex those muscles again awesome because we're like figuring out the rules still in like sort of like of like getting used to it and so soon we'll be really kind of ready to do to do that kind of thing to do to to set up one shots and to like for instance i have there's a spell um i'm a druid and there's a spell called thunder wave that is like knocks everybody down and last episode I, I i i renamed it bombarda it's gonna be bombarda from, from <laughs> now on smart, so we're, we're having yeah we're having a lot of fun with it and so i'm having a lot of fun there and then there's a bunch of podcasts on all the mischief media in the mischief media network that i think that listeners of Potterless would really enjoy so i encourage you to search that in your in your thingy yeah do it search in the thingy well melissa thank you so much for coming on listeners thanks for listening and as they say in the wizarding world of harry potter before they fly off in their invisible cars wizard on do they (laughs) (laughs) still one of my favorite moments across any episode of Potterless ever (laughs) i had to say it It it's so good Hey, we've got more information about the Multidude Digital Live Show on July 30th. I will be partaking in two segments. One, I will be giving a TED Talk about why Tony Hawk's Underground is the most important video game of the 21st century, and I'm going to be doing Meddling Adults Live. It's going to be super fun. There's a lot of great segments. I'm very excited for all of them, and if you want to get tickets now, you can go to multitude.productions slash digital live. You'll also get a code where you can re-watch it, so if 8 p.m. on the 30th doesn't make sense for you, that is okay. You can watch it whenever you want, and you can get tickets and learn more about the show, like how we're giving 25% of the proceeds of Black Lives Matter charities at multitude.productions slash digital live. 
Potterless was created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Klaus Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Rosemary Dodge, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadanera, Audra Eleanor Curlin, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Pulido, Orca Grower, Vivian, the Owl, Haley Hastings, Moster, Alex Consilver, John Cotker, Noel Basile, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark, Lou Frida, J. Svensson, Summer Rathel, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Addy, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Eileen Gazesh, Keegan Curran, Mr. Folk, Maya, Floor Sake, Series Girls for Georgia Davis, Skyla Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskov Chova, Elizabeth Christofferson, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Binkowski, Jen Went, Nedry OS, Will Husser, Samantha Lentz, Aurora Fruhoff, Marco Cepeda, Courtney Marie Grieger, Ashen Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Fail on the Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, McKenna Tweedy, Heather Langeal, Brad Harding, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chrissy Tu, Jarl Spivan, Ashley Enstrom, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jen and Rose Dowd, Callahan and Darius, Leah Reed, Melissa Rob, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Elizabeth Yu, Britt McLean, Becca Spry, Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Lily's mom, T Run Money, Madison Kyle, Don't Call Me Ninfedora, GK Have It Your Way, Sabrina Balsaker, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farz and Jarabat, Melanie DeGrave, David Douglas, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Yimki Bony Pony, Jacob Rossitano, Kelsey Gillespie, Taco Blowfish, Rike Mango Jensen, Taylor Payne, Rachel Mobbs, Megan Moon, Alicia Chapman, Riley Kittis, Colleen Waters, Laurel Happy, Ross Ann Batamana, Erica Butler, Miranda Hurley, Landon Schwausch, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Chanley, Darcy Alexandra Harrison, Richard Johnson, Sandra Rose, Kremick Roberts, Andren Kaufman, K.A. Rob, Steve Trelore, Lior Nahum, Angela Hill, Julia Buzak, Demi Lynn, Kelsey Wellis, Michael Beck, Calista Delano, She Who Doesn't Have to Be Named, L. Kringle, Love Cash Longer, Jennifer Terzian, Crystal Pollard, Henrique Wolf, Jeremy Elmore, Delkis, Katrina Smith, Jerrica Law, Michelle Spurgeon, Casey Canales, Megan Stempin, Let's Hit a Thousand Patrons, Serenity, Alan Jax, G, Sophia Lyons, Sot, Matthew Babbitt, Dane Nemcher, Rochelle Unitmaz, Kirsty, Robin Garcia, Chick Parr, Mermaid and her Daddy Kins, Aaron Uggs, Not My Daughter, You Biatch, Ilaria Vicentin, Liam Simmons, Lori, Gregory Hughes, Christy Lee, Caw Caw, Mother Feathers, Nina Jazalik, Ribbon Monstrosity, Brittany Harper, Shulman Atrix, It's Definitely Ludo Bagman, Your Friendly Neighborhood Ravenclaw, Gavin Miller, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campamanas. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash potterless. And for merch, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to tell someone about the show, whether you know a Harry Potter nerd in your life that hasn't listened to the podcast yet, you go, hey, you should listen to the show. It's really good. I think you like it. Or you leave a rating and review online. That would really help, and I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as I say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Wizard on!